These VC prisoners were captured five days ago by elements of the 1st and 2nd Brigade, 1st Air Cavalry Division. Taken with them was this young boy, a confirmed Viet Cong. Also captured at the same time was a huge cache of arms which the VC had hidden in the hills for use when needed. Now it is 19 September. Operation Thayer is in full swing, and the 1st and 2nd Brigades begin the same kind of foot slogging job all over again. Their mission is to capture or destroy all Viet Cong, their arms and supplies, and their hamlets. The hills and valleys they must clear lie in the Bong Son Phu Cat area. With one sector cleared, a company commander briefs his men on the airlift, which will transport them to a new location. UH-1Ds land on the extraction LZ to pick them up. Tactics are for the first cavalrymen to drop onto each plateau or valley where the VC are operating. From captured equipment and medical records, it is estimated that a VC unit larger than battalion size is in the area. The troops offload, ready to fight the moment they hit the ground. They move off the LZ quickly, ready to engage the enemy with every available weapon. Generally, each company operates as a separate unit, with responsibility for clearing an assigned area. Jungle flowers glisten in the bright sunlight as the men move out to clear a new area in these coastal highlands that border the South China Sea. A Buddhist temple attracts their attention as the search continues. Orders are given for the troops to check the temple for VC activity. Two farmers, cleared by interrogators, return to their fields as the sky troopers move in on the temple. The troops search the area thoroughly, but find no suspects or VC supplies. After the temple itself is found to be free of Viet Cong, the first cavalrymen resume their walk in the sun, recalling that the large arms cache captured five days ago was found just off this path. A stream reflects the sunlight perhaps reminding them that everything will look different in the monsoon rains, which will come soon. Each hut and haystack is checked. It is known that the entire area is a VC supply stronghold, and that some VC live with their families in hamlets and isolated huts. They raise rice and other food, hiding their weapons until needed and fleeing into the underbrush when our forces approach. On this occasion, however, some don't escape in time. Of six suspects found hidden in huts and underbrush, five are confirmed VC. One likely reason for their presence today is that these hills and valleys are used as a Viet Cong rest and recreation area during the monsoon season, which is expected daily. With the village cleared of VC, the first cavalrymen move out again, trying to sweep the area before the rains begin. To their rear lies Hammond Airstrip, constructed especially for Operation Thayer. Here, ammunition, supplies, and replacements are brought in daily by caribou and delivered to the field by Chinooks and Hueys. It is 4 October, and Operation Thayer has entered its second phase, codenamed Operation Washington Irving. The rain gear and wet fatigues worn by these men of the 1st Brigade 1st Air Cavalry Division means only one thing, 
the monsoon rains have come. Shafts of sunlight temporarily warm the troops and the heavy jungle growth, but is too short in duration to dry either. Specific mission is to seek and destroy two battalions of North Vietnamese regulars who are reported to be massing for an attack on Hammond airstrip. Loss of the airstrip could prove critical. Except for isolated sniper fire, no contact has been made thus far. Only one village is discovered on their route. As always, the troops remain alert for any Viet Cong who may be hiding but a thorough search fails to turn up any VC or anything more significant than some propaganda leaflet. The only male found in the village is a young boy. He is put through an intensive interrogation by an interpreter who translates what he says to the company commander. A radio man maintains contact with the CP as the wet, weary men grasp the opportunity to rest for a minute or two. The women are also interrogated. VC often flee before searching US troops, then return as soon as it is safe. The first cavalrymen hand out candy to the village children. The chaplain, soaked and mirroring the intense weariness of all, warms himself with some hot cocoa. As good as it tastes, he shares it with one of the men. They move out again across the muddy countryside. Thus far, 30 hours after it began, Operation Irving has netted the multi-brigade 1st Cavalry Force 271 enemy dead, 60 captured, and 200 suspects. Given a chance to return to base camp overnight, they remove some of their soaked clothing. The sound and sight of an approaching Huey quickly raises their spirit. With any luck, it may be bringing in food, cigarettes, and even some dry clothing. Well, they're half lucky. It brought food as well as cigarettes and other assorted items, but very little clothing. They'll have to dry out what they have. Even GI coffee tastes good especially when you're cold and it's hot. Maybe the rain will start again and wash off the lather, but at least the chopper brought dry socks. As the rain pelts down again, first cavalrymen line up for hot chow. It may be their last for days. On 28 September, troops of the 1st Air Cavalry Division arrive by air and vehicular convoy at LZ Uplift in the area near Bong Son. During operations there, this central highlands location will be the site of brigade forward headquarters. Security troops begin searching the area, including a nearby hamlet. Each individual dwelling is searched for hidden weapons and ammunition. Operation Thayer, which began early in September, is a joint effort of the 1st Air Cav, ROK troops, and elements of the Army of South Vietnam. As the search continues, an old man is located, and he is asked many questions about the VC. His answers are vague and uncertain. Continuing the search, the troopers locate several bunkers in and around the little hamlet. These are used to protect the women and children during mortar attacks and are found to be empty. When additional bunkers are found in the surrounding area, it is decided to search the village daily to prevent the enemy from using it. A few kilometers to the rear, some new VC prisoners are logged in at the brigade's forward prisoner compound at the Hammond airstrip. Here at the resupply center and forward area airstrip, the 1st Cav Provo Marshal and Division Military Intelligence 
operate a prisoner of war holding compound. Prisoners of all kinds are interrogated here. Hardcore VC, North Vietnamese troops, and some, like these women, who are suspected Viet Cong. Later, the prisoners are transferred to the main division compound at Pleiku. Captured enemy material is also brought to this forward compound. Everything imaginable, from uniforms and mortars to commo wire and carrying baskets. During daily sick call, the medics administer to the needs of the injured or sick prisoners. Even the lowly toothache is treated during these daily medical aid periods for the prisoners. Seriously ill prisoners are given first aid by the medics at this compound and are then evacuated to the medical detachment or surgical hospital in Quignon. When they have recovered, they are then returned to the compound and transshipped to the main prisoner compound at 2nd Corps headquarters. Before dawn on September 6, a platoon from the 17th Cavalry quietly boards a fleet of Vietnamese naval patrol junks in Thuy Hoa Harbor. The junks are taking the men to a deserted beach just north of a fishing village 12 kilometers away. This is the first step in Operation Seward, a major effort to protect the rice harvest in the Thuy Hoa region from VC hands. The men land just beyond the village, a confirmed Viet Cong stronghold. They will act as a blocking force as other units hit the village from the west and the south. The patrol junks pull back to the horizon to intercept any local boats which might sound the alarm. Sure enough, Mac V advisor, Lieutenant Paul Aquilino, spots a sampan. The craft is brought alongside. While the patrol commander questions the fishermen, the sampan is searched. Nothing suspicious is found, and the men are allowed to proceed away from the village. Not far from the beach, the platoon is hit by sniper fire. With secrecy no longer possible, a spotter plane is called in to locate the VC position. Although sprayed with ground fire, the pilot gets off a marking rocket. The platoon opens up on the area with rifle fire. Then artillery support is called in from the rear. The request is immediately answered by 105 millimeter howitzers of the 27th artillery. The rice fields are pounded and the sniping abruptly stops. The platoon quickly moves out to sweep the area. Later, it was learned that the snipers were part of a Viet Cong force which was surprised as it left the village to ambush a convoy along Highway 1. This is confirmed, as the village itself is swept by a Vietnamese regional force. They find it virtually deserted. After a quick search for weapons and rice, the Vietnamese move out, combing the underbrush for hidden VC as they move back toward Highway 1. While combat forces keep the Viet Cong under pressure, another phase of Operation Seward gets underway at Thuy Hoa on 17 September. This convoy is transporting rice captured from the VC to the village of Lai Hai, 48 kilometers away. Security is provided by a unit from the 17th Cav. Until recently, the fear of Viet Cong ambush restricted the use of these highways but since the operation began, there have been few incidents. An artillery observer rides along to direct fire support in case of an attack.
At Lai Hai, the people are waiting eagerly, and no time is lost in handing out the rice. It is being distributed at this time so that the farmers can work on the harvest without taking time out to procure food for daily needs. Similar efforts are going on in other villages as Operation Seward meets with continuing success. On 27 September, at their staging area near Long Bin, a unit of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment is briefed for their first mission in Vietnam, escorting a convoy of engineers through Viet Cong territory. The men move out, boarding their armored assault vehicles. These vehicles are similar to armored personnel carriers, but have been modified and more heavily armed for combat missions. In addition to the usual caliber 50 machine gun, each carries two M60 machine guns mounted on the side. The convoy gets rolling, heading for Juan Loc, 40 kilometers to the north. There, the engineers are at work setting up a permanent base camp for the 11th Armored. The men remain on alert as the convoy rolls through small villages along the way. There is no sign of the VC, but near a rubber plantation, one of the assault vehicles breaks down. Some of the crew fan out to provide security, while the others try to repair the trouble. All sorts of methods get a try but to no avail, and a recovery vehicle is soon brought to the scene. Coupled together, the vehicles move out to catch up with the rest of the convoy. A few days later, at the staging area, an armored assault vehicle mounted with a flamethrower is put through its paces. The vehicle spews flaming napalm in all directions as a group of officers look on. The purpose of the demonstration is to show the many capabilities of these vehicles to officers of units which will be supported by them. After watching the exercise, the officers get a chance to examine the vehicle in detail and talk to its crew. The commanding officer of the U.S. 13th Aviation Battalion discusses a new operation with members of his staff at the Gokong Airfield, 48 kilometers south of Saigon. The date is 27 September. On the pads, crewmen load 2.75 rockets into the pods of the gunships of the Mavericks. The operation, known as Operation Kulong 42-66, is being carried out by troops of the Vietnamese 7th Infantry Division. It is part of the Allied effort to expel the VC from the Delta country. The flight to the Hoa Bin district, a few kilometers southwest of the Gokong airfield, is of short duration and the Arvin troops are put aground. The troop lift choppers pull out. When they return, the aviation battalion commander is brief. Late in the day, the American helicopters pick up the friendly Vietnamese troopers and return them to Go Kong. After a wearying search through the muddy swamps all day, the Arvin soldiers wash their boots and relax. Tomorrow they will continue the operation. It is early morning at the helicopter base at Ankei.
Today, 28 September, as on other mornings since the month of May, this rotary wing Army aviator reports in at the operations shack. At the briefing, he is given the day's assignment for his CH-47 Chinook helicopter. The overall mission will be to fly resupply missions in support of the first air cav units engaged in Operation Sayer. Specific missions will be assigned at the Hammond airstrip 72 kilometers to the northeast. Flight number 069. Takeoff time, 1,200 hours. Weather, clear with visibility 15 kilometers. Mission control at Hammond. Code name, Backbuster 50. Enemy situation, scattered automatic weapons fire northeast of LZ Hammond. All of these facts, plus the job of flying, go through the pilot's mind as the Chinook heads northeast. Approaching the forward resupply base, a map check is made to orient the two flyers. Radio instructions from Backbuster 50 direct the aircraft to the refueling area. A briefing is held for 069. The pilot and co-pilot learn that they are to deliver a load of 155 howitzer ammunition to LZ Uplift and pick up a quarter-ton truck and mechanical mule for repair. Minutes later, the Chinook is hovering over its load. The pallet of artillery rounds weighing nearly 12,000 pounds is sling-loaded, and the hookup man snaps the lift ring into place as he is buffeted by rotor wash. The big turbine engines surge under power, and the Chinook exerts tons of lift. The load of ammunition rises smoothly from the ground, and mission number 80-28 begins. Nearing position uplift, the smoke marker is clearly visible. Over the IP, the load is stabilized momentarily, then it is eased onto the ground. The sling is released, and 069 climbs off toward the pickup point where it will load internally the quarter-ton truck and the mechanical mule for delivery back to LZ Hammond. Starting the return leg, 069 wheels southwestward, passing over position uplift. Inside the aircraft, the vehicles have been firmly strapped in place. Flying time will be approximately one hour. By mid-afternoon, the first air cav resupply base at Hammond is reached and the vehicles carried by 069 are offloaded. Immediately, a truckload of fresh foodstuff is picked up. Nearby, two other CH-47s are picking up sling loads of water and ammunition destined for the same location in the forward area around Bong Son. Operation Thayer is, at this time, concentrated in the Bong Son sector. Preparing for takeoff, 069 is carrying a cargo of fresh meat, eggs, vegetables, fruits, and assorted packaged rations. Backbuster 50 is sending the supplies to LZ Coil, a mountaintop artillery position in the coastal highlands. En route, the big chopper flies over great stretches of enemy-held countryside. Eager hands help unload the needed rations at LZ Coil. Since their arrival in Vietnam a year ago, Chinook helicopters have carried more than 157 million pounds of cargo. And still, there is more to do. A moment of relaxation on the return flight. Then, the airstrip is rising to meet them. But the day's work is not yet done. An artillery support base in the battle zone has urgently requested ammunition resupply before nightfall. Backbuster 50 says, go again. The need must be met. 069 rises with its load, moving to keep pace with the dwindling light of day. This is the way it is, flying air support in Vietnam.
On 13 September, a battery of self-propelled guns is added to the 101st Airborne's arsenal of artillery. The new unit is greeted by General Willard Pearson, commander of the 101st, who fires the first round from one of the huge 175 millimeter guns. Consisting of two 8-inch and two 175 millimeter guns, the battery is presently situated near Tuihua. Its initial assignment is to support Operation Seward in securing the rice harvest of the region. With a range of more than 11 miles, these big guns can be zeroed in on Viet Cong positions over 300 square miles of territory. On 25 September, 11 Vietnamese liberated from a Viet Cong prison camp by the 101st Airborne Division are given refuge near Thuy Hoa. One, a former Viet Cong who defected and was imprisoned only a month, seems in a permanent state of shock. The others, resting in this tactical command post, seem fleshless chunks of skin stretched tightly across bones. The longest term served by any was 19 months. They include two housewives, three popular forces soldiers, two farmers, two hamlet officials, and an Arvin PFC. The former Viet Cong fails to respond to treatment, and his eyes are something his rescuers will never forget. The others are given the opportunity to bathe in a nearby canal. The cool water proves therapeutic, bringing on the first smile. Some even wash their clothes. Nourishment must be taken slowly. The doctors and the medics take over. They treat infections, open sores, malnutrition, pneumonia, and other ailments. A week later, one of the freed prisoners will be strong enough to lead the 101st to another prison camp where 23 other military and civilian Vietnamese will be liberated. On 27 September, at An John Hamlet near Thuy Hoa, villagers here, the deputy district chief, speak on the Chu Hoi program, designed to win over Viet Cong sympathizers and even active Viet Cong. They receive clothing from a psychological warfare team of the 101st Airborne Division. It's a grab bag arrangement and some consider making a trade. However, most seem more than satisfied with what they have received. Villagers also are given booklets from the Psy War team. Viet Cong who defect receive guarantees against reprisals. Once every week, teams of doctors and corpsmen visit each village and hamlet in the area of Vietnam known as War Zone D, as part of the 173rd Airborne's Medical Civic Action Program. On the 6th of October, members of the 25th Medical Detachment, led by Captain Lenny L. Hammerjein, prepare to visit Tai Hung, approximately 15 kilometers northwest of Ben Hoa on the Saigon River. Native sampans are provided by the village chief for the crossing. On the other side, a large turnout awaits the Americans. At the village courtyard, the job begins. Through an interpreter, each patient describes his ailments to the medic, and they are treated accordingly. This prescription for throat lozenges and all the other injections and vitamin supplements and drugs which are dispensed are done so free of charge from a supply brought in by the medic. At a nearby school, dental care is also provided. Nearly 900 inhabitants are treated that day. After a short walk to the outskirts of Tai Hung, the medics arrive at an orphanage sponsored by Catholic Charities. Under the watchful eye of Father Tron Hiem Mao, the children are rounded up for treatment. 
More than 150 of them are examined by Captain Hammerjein before the team departs. These visits, although every week, are never on the same day, as it would be unwise of us to give the Viet Cong still operating in the area a pattern to go by. Annual flooding in the Mekong Delta region is wreaking its usual havoc. The vast region south of Saigon is completely underwater, a result of the seasonal monsoon. Villages like Trom Chin have been hard hit. The dismal scene reflects the engulfment and isolation of homes along the low-lying canals. Crops and rice paddies are destroyed, creating acute food shortages. Near the special forces camp at Don Fuoc, all activity grinds to a halt. And throughout the area, roads have been washed out. The Vietnamese carry on as best they can, and wading or rowing are the most practical means of locomotion. But men and helicopters of the 13th Aviation Battalion are on the job, airlifting rice and supplies to the flooded areas. Inundation, an added hardship to a country already beset with the problems of war. Bung Ro Bay, where port facilities have been under construction since early August, is beginning to function as an important new harbor in Vietnam. LST ramps, an underwater pipeline, and a tide flexible pier are now in operation. Activity at the bay is stepping up sharply as freighters laden with supplies from the United States have begun to arrive regularly. The cargo from these large vessels, which cannot move close to shore, is first transferred to barges. The barges then tie up at the pier and cranes go to work moving the material ashore. Until July, Bung Ro Bay was used by the Viet Cong to receive supplies from the north. Two Viet Cong supply ships sunk by U.S. aircraft still lie on the bay floor. Most of the supplies of ammo, vehicles, and equipment are headed for the Tui Hua area, 18 kilometers away. They are trucked out to Highway 1 by way of a one-and-a-half-mile road hacked into the cliffside by Army engineers. Before the road could be surfaced, however, two days of torrential rains recently turned it into a sea of mud. While bulldozers and men of the engineer units work to get it cleared, all incoming supplies are being temporarily stockpiled on the beach. As more facilities are completed, Bung Ro Bay will play an increasingly important role in Vietnam's supply operation. 